It's the last Sunday of Advent, and thank you once again for tuning in and for spending this time with us. And we trust that today you'll be both blessed and encouraged by all that you hear. We're drawing near once again to that event which brings the world to a standstill, the event which was the turning point in all the history of the world. This Christmas of 2020 will be celebrated by countless millions of people in every country on earth at the end of a year which has witnessed the world being brought to its knees by a global pandemic and all its social, economic and political fallout. Airlines have been grounded, ships have been docked, huge retailers have collapsed and countless lives have fallen apart, all by a tiny virus, 10 million of which would fit on one millimeter. The storms of life always expose the foundations upon which nations, communities, and individual lives have been built. Almost a hundred years ago, the famous British intellectual Bertrand Russell gave a talk at Battersea Town Hall, which would later be published and become a very famous essay entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian. In that, Russell argued that belief in the God of the Bible generated fear, and that if we as a people were to get rid of the fear of the God of the Bible, then all other fears would evaporate before the morning sun and we would have a bright future set before us. This is what he said. Religion is based primarily on fear of the unknown and partly the wish to have an elder brother who will stand by you in your trouble and disputes. In this world, we can begin to understand things, to master them with the help of science. Science can help us get over this fear. Our hearts can teach us no longer to look around for imaginary supports, no longer to invent allies in the sky, but rather to look to our own efforts here below to make this world a fit place to live in. We see what he's saying, shake off belief in and fear of the God of the Bible and then a bright new future will unfold before us in which all fears will be gone. Almost a hundred years on, things could hardly be more different than what Russell imagined they would be. As a culture, we have indeed turned away from the living God. He's no longer feared in any way. And he has no place in our public life and public institutions. And yet far from our lives being set free from fear, they are more fearful than ever, dominated by fear. The last 10 months have brought to the surface what had long been bubbling under the surface. What commentators have long referred to as a culture of fear. Fear of global terrorism, fear of extreme weather, fear of political turmoil and anxieties. Free floating in the air, in the ether. The jump from one thing to the next, from knife crime to child safety. The more we seek to insulate ourselves against these perceived threats, the more anxious we have become. And of course, this global pandemic has only exacerbated all of our fears and our anxieties. Is there an answer to this anxiety and the fears which dominate our lives? There is one and only one given in that word at Christmas time in which the angels announced, do not be afraid. Afraid, I bring you good news of great joy. Luke's biography of Jesus Christ, the man who stopped the clock, who tore up the calendar and started a new era in the whole history of the world, 
begins by describing the way in which his famous birth took place. Luke chapter 2 verse 1, in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone went to his own town to register. At that time, this imperial decree from Caesar Augustus in Rome was sending people all across the empire back to the places of their origin. Caesar Augustus, this great world leader who had risen to power through assassinations of hundreds of senators and of knights in an overthrow of what had been the old order. And yet, seemingly arbitrary as this decree was, and the inconvenience that it no doubt caused countless people across the Roman Empire, unknown to him, all that was happening was fulfilling plans and purposes much, much older than himself or even the Roman Empire. 700 years before, the Hebrew prophet Micah had announced that the Messiah himself would be born in Bethlehem. This prophecy made by the Holy Spirit from the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, who controlled all of human history, governing, reigning, directing the course of all history, who had never once taken his eyes off the road or his hand off the wheel or dropped the ball, but was continuing to sustain and uphold the whole course of human history and the cosmos at every moment. Augustus, while sending out his decree, was no doubt little aware that on his part he was obeying the higher decree of the king of all kings. Little would he have thought that he was reigning on his throne in Rome only for the sake of this unborn, unknown baby in Bethlehem. As one writer beautifully put it like this, that the poll tax of the first emperors should be the instrument of bringing forth the king before whom the Caesars were to bow, discovers a God who is directing all the course of history. And so in fulfillment of that ancient prophecy, a poor couple made their way towards Bethlehem, that small town, too small to be mentioned by Joshua or by Nehemiah. And yet that small town with its long backstory of suffering to glory, of outsiders being brought inside of a famous royal dynasty and house, the house of the kings of Judah and their father David. The place which was the bread of life, the house of bread and the place of fruitfulness. Verses four to five. And so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Edward I, or Edward Longshanks as he was called, was the King of England from 1272 to 1307. He had a number of children. One of his children was called Edward Edmund of Woodstock. Edmund of Woodstock's descendants, one of them became a butcher in a very small village. Another became the keeper of a turnpike, you know, uh, the, the play where roads met. And so that great house, like this royal line of the kings, was in some ways we might say reduced to very humble occupations, the butcher and the turnpike controller. The great line of the kings of Judah, the splendor of that royal house of David and of Solomon, had dwindled 
to this very low point to a humble carpenter in a small backwater. This humble carpenter and his wife made their way towards Bethlehem while the puppet king Herod sat on the throne of Judah. Now, of course, he wasn't in the line of the kings of Judah. He was from Idumea. He was an Idumean. A prophecy had been made some 2,000 years before by the patriarch Jacob, in which he had said that the scepter would not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. Some nine months earlier, the mighty angel Gabriel had appeared to Mary and said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the one to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Mary and Joseph made their way to Bethlehem. And there in verse 6, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born a son and she gave birth to her firstborn a son she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn what a glorious event this birth that would change everything else for ever what a scene countless Paintings have attempted to capture the wonder of that moment. The great Italian painter Raphael tried again and again for years to capture the scene. And yet he always felt that he had failed to really do it justice. Others with words, with music, as well as painters have tried to capture the wonder of what happened in that stable and yet no one has ever really been able to do justice to what then took place as he who is the eternal and everlasting son of God the father God the word who had first made the heavens and the earth came down by the power of the Holy Spirit, sent by his almighty Father, to from the Virgin Mary take on our flesh and become your brother and mine forever. A member of the human race and family coming down to lift us up, becoming our brother to make us sons and daughters of his own Almighty Father forever, the majesty and the miracle of that first Christmas. As one person put it, that eternity should be born, that he who thunders in the heavens should cry in the cradle. As Charles Wesley put it, that being source should begin to be and God himself be born. Christine Rossetti had it. Lo, within a manger lies he who built the starry skies. As C.S. Lewis beautifully expressed it, once in our world a stable held something in it that was bigger than our whole world. This high one had come down to cast in his lot with our family forever. He was wrapped in poor cloths and placed in a manger where the animals were fed. Many others have been placed in much more grand surroundings than that. And yet, even if a Caesar 
had been placed in a manger, it would have stayed just a manger. He, by being placed in this manger, changed it forever and made it more glorious than any palace that any king had ever been born in. And yet, doesn't that scene of Bethlehem also, as well as that beauty and glory of what was happening, also strike us with great sadness as well? Look at the end of verse 7. There was no room for them in the inn. No room made for them in the inn. How sad that there should have been so little room and space made for Jesus at Christmas time. No room in the inn, just in the way that there would be no room for him in the property ladder throughout his entire life. And at his death, there would be no room for him to have his own grave, but he would have a borrowed grave. The world made no space, no room for him, the one who had made space for it and for us all at the very beginning. The one who had made space in his own infinite and eternal life and presence to give the universe room and space to exist. The world hasn't changed. It's still cold and hostile and hard towards him. Today, the doors of almost all our public institutions have closed to him. There are signs outside saying no room for Jesus here. Even the, even the institutions that bear the names of great followers of Jesus of the past. He cannot go inside. It would be felt to be inappropriate or harmful or somehow destructive to bring Jesus inside those doors. And yet all that he ever brings is help and life and healing and salvation. What about you this Christmas time? Let's not worry so much about public institutions, but about ourselves. Is there room in our hearts, in your heart, for Jesus this Christmas time? Not just for him to come into one room or to occupy one compartment, but rather to fill your heart and life with his presence, for him to reign in your heart as king, to take control of your time, your money, your gifts, for you to yield them all up to him and surrender them all to him and lay them all down at his feet and place them at his disposal. This Christmas time, he has room in his heart for you. He will make space and is making and has made space in his heavenly kingdom for you. This Christmas time, allow him to come in and to fill your heart. Not just to be a guest to stay for a night, but for the one to come in and reign and rule forever. To fill your heart with joy and with peace that will never go away. It was when I was only uh, four years old, not quite five years old, that I still remember kneeling down with my father in our house and asking the Lord Jesus to come into my heart, to take away my sins and to be my own personal Lord and Savior. He did that day. Have you ever invited him to come in? And allowed him to come with all that he will bring today, this Christmas time. Receive him, maybe for the very first time. While the doors on earth were closing to Jesus, those above, those great and mighty angels, the heavenly hosts, the heralds of that unseen higher reality and higher heavenly kingdom couldn't keep silent. They had to announce the glory of what was taking place. You know, we sometimes imagine that we're all alone in the world, 
in the way in which Bertrand Russell envisaged it, and that if there was something else somewhere out there, that it would be hostile and against us and our way of life, and would only be coming to the earth to destroy us and to conduct all kinds of horrible experiments on us. And yet that is not at all true. At Christmas time, at this first Christmas, these great and powerful angels, these heralds of the heavenly kingdom, came not to destroy, but to bring good news. Good news of great joy that would be for all the people. Look at it in verse 8. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. To these poor shepherds, nobody's really out in the fields at night, keeping watch over their small flocks. Good shepherds working round the clock for the safety of their sheep. This powerful angel announced this glorious good news and said to them, Do not be afraid. One of 365 times in the Bible in which they and we are told not to be afraid. In the midst of a world troubled, plagued by bad news, this angel was announcing a message of good news. In a world of great sadness in which rivers of tears flow, their message was one of great joy. In a world torn apart in which everyone is fighting for their own interests, a world at strife, this message was for everybody. It belonged to the whole world, the announcing of the one to be born, whose birth was for all the peoples, reconciling men and women, rich and poor, slave and free, east and west, bringing them all together and making them brothers and sisters of his own forever. What was this message that would do this and would change the world forever? Well, the message was that today in verse 11, in the town of David, a saviour has been born. A saviour has been born. What is a saviour? Captures our imagination. The heroism of the person who gives their life to deliver others from harm, those that are unable to deliver themselves. The soldier laying down his life for his country. The generous benefactor buying someone out of debt, setting them free. The statesman standing up for their nation against tyranny and bringing great peace and joy and welfare for their people. There was an old missionary who went to the Inuit people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And as they sought to explain who he was and all that he had come to do, they found that the Inuit peoples didn't have a word for saviour in their language. The missionary was clever and so he tried to think of how it might be that a concept might be expressed by those peoples and so he asked them when they went out fishing on their boats did they ever find that they were in storms to which of course they said yes they did and then he said and, and in those storms do you ever fall into the sea 
and find yourself in great danger to which the Inuit peoples agreed, yes, we do. He said, is it then ever that someone, a friend or maybe a brother, might reach down into the waters in which you were dying and lift you up and bring you to safety again? They said, yes, that does happen. And of course, the missionary said, what's the name for that friend? The one who reaches down to you when you're in desperate trouble and lifts you up back to life and safety again. And when they told him the word that they used for that person, he, of course, then used that word at every point in the future instead of the word saviour. That person who reaches down to us, who are lost and in trouble, in fear and in darkness, is Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Savior of the world, sent by his Father to reach down to us who are lost, who cannot save ourselves, who reaches down and lifts us up, brings us to life and salvation, saving us from our sins, from death and from hell, to allow us to know him and be part of his family forever. How can he do it? Because he is Christ the Lord, the one who is anointed by his Father with the Holy Spirit, beyond measure, sent by his Father as the Lord of all to take away our sins and to lift us up and bring us into his family forever. The angels couldn't keep quiet. They couldn't allow this night this glorious wonder to go unsung. And so in verse 13, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Isn't it beautiful? The shepherds had heard the angels' song, and now, trusting what they had heard, they didn't go to Bethlehem in verse 15 to see if this thing has happened, but to see this thing that has happened. They had heard and now they hurried to see for themselves. In verse 16, they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and her baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. They heard, they hurried, they saw, they didn't keep it to themselves. They shared it with everyone that they could and they returned praising God for what had taken place this Christmas time. Let's remember how on that first Christmas, these shepherds found their shepherd. The way in which they cared for a small flock of sheep on a hill outside of Bethlehem was the way in which this great one, Jesus Christ, would care and has cared and is caring for countless millions of people all across the world. This good shepherd who has laid down his life for you and for me. This Christmas time, remember that all the promises concerning him have come true. 
Remember that we are not alone in the universe, not having to invent allies in the sky or looking for help around us from our own imaginations. No, the true and the living God has come down. Your Saviour has been born to you. He was given to you by God the Father to belong to you today and forever. This Christmas time, receive him again and allow him to flood your heart and your life with his joy and his peace. From early times, Christians have set the celebration of the birthday of Jesus Christ in the darkest point of the year in December to show that his birth is the turning point, not only in the year, but also in history and in our lives. That after the darkness, there will be light. That after the dark, cold days of winter, there will be spring and summer again. And that it is Jesus who will change the seasons and who will one day come again to renew and restore all things. And that you and I, who have simply trusted him and loved him, and allowed him to come in, there will be space and room made for you and I to live with him forever in that glorious future which he has made for us. This Christmas time, may you know his joy and his peace and the hope for all that he will bring today and each day of this year of 2020 and the years to come. Amen.